hiding a character's true identity was a lot more difficult to play out in the show than it was in the books. It's a lot easier for George Martin to deceive readers, since we're using our imagination to create a visual for his characters. Unless you're Arya or one of the Faceless Men, you're not going to have much luck deceiving viewers. Like in the case of Barriss and Selmy running off to Essos to serve Daenerys. The show writers didn't even bother with his whole false identity storyline. He actually grew out a beard and ditched his sword, as well as calling himself Arston Whitebeard so that no one could recognize him. He even went as far as to become a squire for another character, so his fighting skills wouldn't give his true identity away. He wanted to observe Daenerys first before committing to serve her. He served her father as one of his king's guard and witnessed his madness firsthand. Barristan wanted to make sure Danny didn't inherit the infamous Targaryen madness that even inflicted her older brother Viserys. He eventually does admit to her who he truly is. She's upset at first, but will quickly get over it after acknowledging Barristan's trustworthiness and honesty. But Barristan isn't the only character to travel to Essos to join Danny under the guise of a false identity. Tyrion had to pretend to be a dwarf performer under the name Hugar Hill, Hill being the last name for bastards born in the Westerlands, and he was always good at flips and cartwheels in the books. Duran Martell's firstborn son, Quintin, went through the long and dangerous journey from Dorne all the way to Marine. He also pretends to be a squire who others began calling Frog. But he didn't travel this far just to serve the Mother of Dragons. He intended to marry her and bring her back with him to Dorne. But he was the prince who came too late. Danny was already set to marry his Darzola Rock. So that he wouldn't return empty-handed, Quentin thought it would be a good idea to try and tame one of her dragons, since one of his distant ancestors had been a Targaryen. Well, his plan ends in a horrible failure. While trying to tame Viserion, Rhaegal breathes dragon fire onto him. He suffers from burns at three days before succumbing to his injuries and dying. Oberyn Martell's daughter, Sorella, is pretending to be a guy in order to study at the Citadel. This primitive world doesn't believe in educating women as of yet. She's taken on the name of Alaris, which is just Sorella spelled backwards. This isn't fully confirmed or anything yet, but it might as well be with all the hints dropped. Probably the biggest fake identity reveal happened very late into the story. While Tyrion is on the boat pretending to be Hugar Hill, he's with a young character named Young Griff. Well, he's supposedly Rhaegar Targaryen's son, who was believed to be killed way before the start of the story, during Robert's rebellion against the Targaryens. If he truly is Rhaegar's son, that would make him the legitimate heir to House Targaryen, which complicates Danny's conquest. He has dreams of becoming the king himself. This quote-unquote boy named Aegon has been dyeing his hair blue to hide his Dalarian characteristics. The blue hair will also make his violet eyes appear more blue. The man pretending to be his father, Griff, is actually one of Rhaegar's old friends, John Cunnington. He's also dyeing his hair blue and acting as a sellsword. But it's very likely that Illyrio and Varys, who have been funding and hiding these two, are deceiving the both of them. Varys is a master of disguise himself, constantly changing his appearance to gather information or move around without being recognized. He used to travel with an acting group as a child, it's where he picked up his skills. He's so good at disguising himself that no one in King's Landing had realized the jailer to the Black Cells had been Varys for like 20 years. Lord Stark, you must be thirsty. Varys. There's the Hound living his new life as a gravedigger in the books, and Sansa simply dyeing her hair a little darker to be Peter Baelish's bastard daughter, Elaine Stone, from the Vale. But the two fakers that I find more interesting have been chilling beyond the wall, a character named Coldhands, and the king beyond the wall himself, Mance Raider. Coldhands was just replaced by zombie Benjamin Stark, but George Martin has come out and said that Coldhands isn't Benjamin in the books. This could be him trying to throw us off, or maybe he's telling the truth. We won't know until the next book. He's only appeared in a couple of chapters, so there isn't much to go on. We know he was a brother of the Night's Watch, but now is a dead man in service of the Three-Eyed Raven and the Children of the Forest. He completely covers up his face, so even though he's traveling with Bran Stark, who would be his nephew, he wouldn't be able to recognize him. Now Mance Raider is another fun one. He's long dead and gone in the show, but for some reason, Melisandre believed it would be beneficial to keep him alive. So she switched his appearance with another wildling, Rattleshirt. There's a lot of fan theories out there trying to explain why she did what she did, with some believing he has Targaryen blood, but I'm not too convinced of any theory about it. For now, I just see him as a powerful and skilled ally to have. She did this by using one of her abilities called Glamouring. Glamours use light and shadows to create this illusion, but also uses suggestion. More importantly, a ruby is involved that the user needs to wear. So that man who was burned alive was Rattleshirt, and Mans has been pretending to be him. When Mans begins to complain about always having to wear Rattleshirt's armor of bones, Melisandre tells him, The bones help. The bones remember. The strongest glamours are built of such things. 
A dead man's boots, a hank of hair, a bag of finger bones, with whispered words and prayer. A man's shadow can be drawn forth from such, and draped about another like a cloak. The wearer's essence does not change, only his seeming. She made it sound a simple thing and easy. They need not know how difficult it had been, or how much it had cost her. That was a lesson Melisandre had learned long before Ashai. The more effortless the sorcery appears, the more men fear the sorcerer. When the flames had licked at Rattleshire, the ruby at her throat had grown so hot that she feared her own flesh might start to smoke and blacken. So we learn that this magic also brings her a significant amount of pain that she continues to bear. This is the interesting quote we get when she removes the glamouring magic on him. Melisandre touched the ruby at her neck and spoke a word. The sound echoed queerly in the corners of the room and twisted like a worm inside their ears. The wilding had heard one word, the crow another. Neither was the word that left her lips. The ruby on the wildling's wrist darkened, and the wisps of light and shadow around him wreathed and faded. This is the magic used to conceal her identity in the show. She believed making herself appear to be far younger than her true age would help with her mission, and she was probably right. It seems like it's more shadow binding than it has to do with the Lord of Light, but Melisandre intertwines the two by saying, Shadow serve the light. Quaith is also a shadow binder from Ashai, but she doesn't bother with pretending to look like someone else. She simply wears a mask, which requires a lot less effort. But this is something that all the residents of the creepy city of Shai do. That doesn't mean she isn't really another character, however. I'd be surprised if she's just simply Quaith from Ashai. She's helping out Daenerys for a reason. A pretty sad and shocking moment excluded from the show was Mance Raider's child. Jon Snow didn't want the baby left so close to Melisandre, who's obsessed with King's blood. So he made Gilly switch babies. Gilly would take Mance's baby with Sam to the Reach, and her baby would be left at the Wall. Wildling babies aren't given a name until they are two because of their high infant mortality rate, so that's why I'm just calling them by their parents' names. There's this mysterious leader of a sellsword company in Essos who simply refers to himself as the Tattered Prince, or the Prince of Tatters, or simply Tatters. He explains that he was once selected to be the Prince of Pentos in his younger days, but ran off because he would simply be a figurehead that the true rulers sacrifice whenever they want. So instead of his life being in control of others, he joined the battlefield. He's an old man in the current book story who wears a cloak made from the ripped clothing of the men he slayed. Every character who comes across him speaks highly of Tatters, but what makes him so mysterious is something he says in the last book. He says that all he has to do is take off his tattered rags to become unrecognizable. At times he travels quietly in a brown wool cloak. The fact that he speaks classic High Valyrian is also a little suspicious. His white hair isn't a giveaway since he's so old, but I wouldn't be surprised if this is a character with some Targaryen blood in him. Probably the most legendary pretender in this story's lore is Bale the Bard. Hundreds if not thousands of years before the start of the story, the greatest raider beyond the wall was called a coward by the Lord Stark at the time. Well Bale took this as a challenge and climbed up the wall and walked down the King's Road to Winterfell under the guise of a singer named Sigarek of Skagos. Sigarek meaning deceiver in the old tongue. He entered the castle and sang for Lord Stark until midnight. He was so impressed by Sigarek that he offered him a reward. Sigarek only requested the most beautiful flower in Winterfell. Lord Stark gave him a winter rose, and the following morning his maiden daughter was missing. She was the last Stark heir to Winterfell, so this was a big deal. Lord Stark sent men to look for him beyond the wall, but they couldn't find him. Months later, she was just back in her room like nothing happened, but with a baby in her arms. They were in the crepes of Winterfell the entire time. After she came out of hiding, he returned home north of the wall, with his child being the next in line to be Lord. Thirty years later, the child was ruling over Winterfell, and Bale the Bard was king beyond the wall. He led a wilding army south and was faced with his own son prepared to fight him. Bale could not fight him, and his son killed him, ending the invasion. This story was turned into a song that the wildlings commonly sing. Egret tells this cool bit of lore to Jon Snow, but he's never heard of it before, so who knows if any of it ever even happened. I can't talk about fake identities without mentioning the master of identity theft, Jokin Hagar. This character was combined with Arya's faceless man teacher in the show, but in the books, he's continuing his mission in Westeros. What that mission is exactly is still a mystery, but during the prologue chapter of the fourth book, we see him seemingly infiltrate the Citadel's locked area, where secret texts are kept away. He does this by killing and taking the face of a novice who was learning to be a maester. A novice would never have access to this locked area, but it was stolen from an older archmaester who's going senile. Arya hasn't changed her face too many times yet, but she has taken on many fake names during her time hiding who she truly is. I know I've missed a bunch of characters either because I thought they were too minor or I just missed some. I'm sure some of you guys will let me know which ones were not included. 
But I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I'll see you all soon. Thanks for watching.